Pum, 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 pum. everybody and welcome to my channel. In this video I'm going to show you a self-made documentation about the real truth about the Dyatlov Pass incident from 1959 in the northern Ural region of Russia. There are more than 70 theories about the Dyatlov case around, but none of them has actually shown as much details, indices and proofs as you are going to see during this documentation. For this reason, I would really appreciate it if you consider giving the video a thumbs up or even joining the channel. It would also be great if some could choose to join my Patreon program or make a small donation through PayPal. Thank you for helping keep the channel alive. I will try to clarify all the facts relevant to the present case so that everyone inevitably sees the truth. But enough of that, let's get started. Let's begin with a brief description of the group Dyatlov. They were nine, or actually ten, polytechnic students from the University of Sverdlovsk who went on a hiking trip to improve their sports grades with a hike of difficulty class 3. One of the ten members of the group, Yuri Yudin, aborted the hike because of health problems. The hike was said to take place on the occasion of the 20th Communist Party Congress. Now I will present you a few pictures of Yuri Yudin, who, according to his own statements, had a closer relationship with Ludmila Alexandrovna Dubainina. He later became the deputy head of Solicomps for Economics. Here you can see a modern picture from an interview by Yuri Yudin, in which he shows a present that he received from Ludmila Dubainina. By the way, I have colored most of the pictures in this documentary, which you can see in this example of Ludmila Dubainina. Here you can see a few pictures from the group's funeral, followed by a more recent shot of the tombstone and the memorial located on the Dyatlov Pass. According to new reports, there should have been an 11th group member named Nikolaevich Bienko. However, he ended the hike prematurely because of an instruction from his superiors. Here I have summarized the most important information about the people in the group and their hiking experience for you. Igor Dyatlo, born 1937, he studied radio technology at the UPI in the fifth semester. He was offered a postgraduate job at UPI during his studies, as he apparently has successfully made improvements in radio technology. He was an experienced hiker with a lot of experience, even on hikes with the highest level of difficulty. There seemed to be a certain interest in Zinita Kolmogorova, which she apparently replied to. Zinita Kolmogorova, born in 1937, studied radio technology in the fifth semester and had sufficient hiking experience for hikes of difficulty class 3, as she had already completed tours in the Urals and Altai. In addition, she is said to have strong leadership skills, it seemed to be particularly popular among the students. Ludmila Dubainina, born in 1938, registered for the hiking club on the first day of her studies. One of her other hobbies was photography, which is why she often took on the job of the photographer. She was shot two years earlier in the Cyan Mountains by a fellow hiker who came to the hunt. Whereby, according to the other hikers, she shouldn't have whined or complained, which was certainly partly responsible for the fact that she herself led a hiking group with difficulty level 2 in the coming year. 
Yuri Nikolaevich Doroskenko, born 1938, he studied in the fifth semester at UPI and had a short relationship with Zinaya Kolmogorova. His specialty were automatic, telemechanical, and electoral measuring instruments and devices. Nikolai Vladimirovich Tabo Brignol, born 1934, he was also a graduate of the UPI, where he studied civil engineering. He also had experience hiking in difficult terrain. He comes from a former aristocratic French mining engineer family, which has settled in the Urals. His father was a victim of one of Stalin's purges and his mother was interned, with the bow born in the camp. Yuri Krivonyshenko was a graduate of UPI in 1959 and worked in a secret facility called Kombinat 187, where he worked as a construction manager. This plant was used to produce weapons-grade fissile material. To be more precise, plutonium was extracted there and the plant is located in Kilibinsk, where one of the greatest nuclear disasters happened in 1957 which was officially kept secret at the time and only became known in the West with perestroika. Krivonyshenko was working there at the time and helped with the cleanup. Alexander Sergeyevich Kolovatov, born 1934, he studied in the fourth semester in the field of technology and physics at the UPI. Before that, he attended a school in the mining and metallurgy sector, specializing in non-ferrous heavy metals. However, he dropped out of this training and went to Moscow where he became the chief laboratory assistant in a secret laboratory of the Ministry of Medium Mechanical Engineering. A bit later, the laboratory became the All-Soviet Scientific Research Institute for Inorganic Materials. During his time there, Kolovatov was doing distance learning and switched to UPI after one year. Rustem Slobodin, born in 1936, like Krivonyshenko, he was already a graduate of the UPI and also worked in a secret facility called Postbox 10, which was the code name for a secret design office. He was a long-distance runner and liked to play a mandolin, which he often took with him during long hiking trips. Semina Alexander Zolotaryov, born 1921, had a military background and was the recipient of four orders from the Soviet Army. He was also involved in the capture of the German V-2 weapon during World War II. He has left his wife, although this could possibly have had a connection with various affairs. Before the hike, he was a top hiking guide at Kurukovka Hostel, having given up his position before the fateful tour. Yuri Avimovich Yudin, born 1937, studied industrial engineering at UPI in the fourth semester and had already completed six large tours of at least 250 kilometers each. Next, I'll show you some pictures from previous expeditions, in which some of the group members participated. By the way, if you look closely at the pictures, you will notice that the group had at least one person with a rifle with them. Personally, I definitely wouldn't venture into this remote wilderness without a gun. Originally the area was inhabited by the Mansi, but they were forced to collaborate with the USSR. Many suspected the Mansi to have something to do with the incident on the Dyatlov Pass, which is why, as we will see in the next pictures, they were interrogated by the investigators working on the Dyatlov case. This is a photo that was taken during one of those mentioned interrogations and show Vladimir Korotav and two Mansi people. The Monsi had just as little to do with the death of the group as a suspected methanol or mushroom poisoning. The theory with the Yeti can also be completely ruled out, because the picture that some people associate with the Yeti is, as you actually see, one of the snapshots of Thibaut Brignol. When the photo is enlarged it is clear that it is not fur at all, but winter clothing. The recognizable hooded jacket is lighter than the trousers, which helps when comparing the following images and allows the bow Brignol to be clearly identified.
Here you can see two old postcards from the Evedel area, which was known for its gold mining by Gulag workers. Some suspected that it was escaped Gulag prisoners who murdered the group. However, this theory can also be completely ruled out, since no prisoner would have been so stupid as to flee northwards, as this would have been simply suicide. Here I show you pictures which were taken by the search team from an airplane in the region of the northern Urals. You can clearly see the industrial complexes that were relocated to this region during and after the Second World War. Then you will see photos of Gulag prisoners, as well as a few insights into what these prison camps look like. Another theory was wild animals, but, as we will see later, the group had at least one rifle with them, which was not mentioned in the investigation files. Another point is that the area around the Kolat cycle is known for the fact that there is practically no game in winter. Which, according to the translation of the mountain name, makes perfect sense, since Kolat cycle translates correctly as lack of game. An avalanche of snowmobile lightning, as well as a comet impact can be excluded as well as the participation of extraterrestrials. But there was also a wild theory that the group died because of the stove in the tent, which also makes absolutely no sense due to the injuries. One should also not forget that even the rescue team had stoves to heat the tents, which would have been very logical if the stove had been considered as such a danger. Now let's take a look at the new investigation into the Dyatlov case, which is more of a farce than really producing new results, they could have put more effort into their research and done much more accurate work with their 3D graphics. It seems to me that it was only created as a diversion that they could show that state authorities were re-investigating the case. Even the greatest of laypeople would have noticed that there was a lot of talk at the media conference, but absolutely nothing new came out by the end. The group could not have died in an avalanche, as the slope of the hill at around 20% is simply not enough for it. In addition, the group's tent was only about 300 meters below the mountain top, which definitely also reduces the likelihood of an avalanche. The footprints found by the search team also speak against this thesis. But they definitely speak in favor of an escape from another event. It would have been much more interesting if a larger section of the map had been shown or if the route of the group had been discussed more, which was completely neglected. However, they didn't expect me. I have made the big effort to create a much more detailed 3D graphic, and of course I will also show a larger map section for you to have a look at. Here you can now see a 3D all-round view of the area in which the group died. I will then overlay an existing map transparently to give you a better overview. Then I show you the map again separately so that you have the opportunity to stop the video to take a closer look at it. This is the view from the east, followed by a more modern photo towards the valley in the north. Here you can see another picture from the media conference in which an avalanche was given as the cause of death. But, I've never heard of a naturally occurring radioactive avalanche. Here I am showing you a photo that was taken by the search team. It can be clearly seen that the slope of the terrain, as mentioned earlier, is in the region of about 20%. It is also noticeable that an inserted ski pole from the group is still upright and that the pile of snow below the tent is higher than above. In order to be able to better imagine where the picture of the search team was taken, I have created an exact montage for you with the help of Google Maps. Here are some modern photos from the same position as the one from the search team. Since you may have missed it, we take another closer look at the photo of the search team, 
as the solution to the case is clearly evident and should actually catch the eye of the attentive observer. The next more modern photos were shot from almost the same spot. I hope that this will give you a better idea of the location of the tent. Now let's look at a map to see why they're not showing any more details. Did you notice the bald spots on the map? I have marked the largest areas with a red circle. It is important that you memorize their shape and size for the remainder of the documentation since, as already mentioned, the incident has nothing to do with a naturally occurring catabatic wind or an avalanche. Next, I'll show you important evidence with the help of a photo the group took before setting up their tent, followed by the image of the search team already shown, with a ski pole still upright in the same position. I've also marked the direction of force of the cause of death with an arrow. I'll go into a little more detail about the group's journey. The group started their journey on January 23rd. They traveled by train from Svertlovsk to Evedel, where they arrived in the night of the 24. January 1959. They then took a Gaz 51 bus from Evedel to Vije. According to Galina Sazanova, all members of the group worked in secret nuclear institutes. It is also known that some of the students had parents working in secret projects. What is striking is that the photos show quite a few military personnel, including higher ranks. It is also noticeable that a relatively large number of cameras were distributed among the group members. Which seems rather unusual for ordinary students during the Soviet era. It should also be clear that not all cameras were recorded in the official investigation files. Another point is that many group members kept diaries or wrote notes. Official sources claim the group died on February 2nd. However, I contend that this cannot be true. The event took place between January 31st and February 1st. According to my theory, no diary entries were made on January 1st and 2nd. From such a tightly organized group I would have expected at least continuity in terms of records. I mention this because after January 31st there are no more entries, that in no way match the time of death determined by investigators. As you may have noticed, the group appears to have been in extremely good spirits. No sign of resentment or aggression can be seen in the pictures, and the students' attitude to work also seemed to have been exemplary. In this picture you can see Igor Dyatlov, the leader of the group. It can be clearly seen that his camera is hanging from the camera strap around his neck. However, the device cannot be clearly identified in his left hand. According to the picture, it doesn't look like an ordinary Soviet compass, but more like a dosimeter. It could be more of a speech device for a radio device, since the object has a grid-like cover. Here you can see the cedar tree where Yuri Alexeevich Krivonyshenko and Yuri Nikolaevich Doroshenko were found by the rescue team. It was found that many branches of the tree had broken off to a height of approximately 15 feet or around 4.6 meters, respectively. Captain Chernikov commented on the situation at the time, mentioning that it would be very difficult to break off such branches, even if one were to hold on to them with full weight, which is why one cannot assume that these branches have been broken off to make fire. After all, there was enough dead wood lying around that could have been used for this with much less effort. Many of the surrounding trees had scorch marks, but the search team quickly realized that the cause of the fire did not come from the ground, but rather from the sky. According to testimonies, fireballs and spherical balls were seen in the sky. According to the statements, it was not about an ordinary bomb, it was described more like a bursting balloon. Radioactivity was also detected and the Geiger counter is said to have clicked often. Now we come to the autopsy reports. The victims suffered a wide variety of injuries such as abrasions, broken bones, burns and discoloration of the skin. Increased radioactivity was also found on certain items of clothing. One reason that the radiation values were no longer given so high could be that some corpses were in running water, which should have led to a strong reduction very quickly. 
The injury pattern does not match that of an avalanche and the distance between the group and the tent does not match either. The injuries are much more similar to those of a bomb explosion, but the radioactivity found does not correspond in any way to a conventional bomb. Now let's take a look at the watches that the search crew found after the incident. It is noticeable that the clocks did not all stop at the same time, which in turn allows the conclusion that not all of the group died at the same time. Another point is that not all watches were officially listed as evidence, even though all of the group had at least one watch with them, which is clearly evident in the next pictures. This is a section of the map of the last village called Ushma, which the group passed before moving towards the Dyatlov Pass. I figured out the time of sunset for both Ushma and the Dyatlov Pass. To get a better idea of what the clocks are in when they may have stopped. In Ushma the sunset at around 5 p.m. and at the Dyatlov Pass the sunset, as it was further north, should have taken place at around 4.50 p.m. Here you can see a photo of Vadim Chernobrov, a well-known Russian ufologist who worked on the Dyatlov case for a long time. It's very noticeable that he died of cancer relatively early, at the age of 52. In his right hand he is holding a piece of a broken tree trunk, whereby it must be ensured that the breakpoint is in no way associated with an avalanche. It was also Vadim Chernobrov who drew the following map, whereby he misinterpreted the direction of the approaching danger, which I will prove in the course of the video. According to my research, the danger undeniably came from the direction of the red arrow shown here. In this picture, taken by the first rescue team, you can see many broken branches and broken trees. The direction makes one believe that the necessary pressure was coming from the southwest, as shown on the previous map. The whole thing is deceptive, as the force was diverted from east to north by the valley and the rising mountain. Most interesting is the tension wire, which can be seen in the lower part of the photo. However, I will only go into this in more detail later and I will explain what it is all about this strange device. As it could already be seen in the autopsy report, there was orange and purple discoloration of the skin on the victims, as well as significantly increased radiation. Here you can see a reference image of a hand injured by radiation. The next picture shows a similar pattern, but the picture is from another mysterious incident, the Chivri case, which also occurred in the former USSR. As you can see here, the effects of radiation damage are very diverse. In addition to cancer, radiation can also lead to reckless behavior. Let us now make a small digression on two similar cases. First of all, the case of the Korovina group at the Hamar Daban Pass should be mentioned as it is very similar to the incident at the Dyatlov Pass. I mention this because some students there also died in extremely mysterious conditions. If you pay attention and memorize the pictures well, you will quickly see the comparison with the following pictures of the Dyatlov Pass. However, I don't want to reveal too much here and let the pictures speak for themselves. It might be worth noting that in this case there was a survivor named Ludmila Korovina. The second case, which also has some similarity, 
would be the incident with the Chivri Pass. A group of students was also involved, but there were no survivors in this incident. It might be important to mention that Anatoly Pirogov's cousin, one of the deceased of the student group, named Viktor Voroshilov, independently started his own investigation. But before Viktor Voroshilov could take part in a second expedition, he was murdered under mysterious circumstances. Another notable feature is that the group's leader, Ludmila Martina has been shown to have ties to the Soviet intelligence, but this does not differ much from the pattern related to the Dyatlov incident, as there were people in the Dyatlov group who were also related to the intelligence service. This included, for example, Semyon Zolotaryov, who took part in the capture of the German V-2, also known as the A-4, during World War II. These are two more modern pictures from the Chivri Pass. They are followed by a photo shot by the hiking group. On closer inspection it is noticeable that several objects can be seen in flight. Make a note of their shape as you will find out later in the course of the video that they are objects similar to the ones on the, the photos of the Dyatlov group as well as the ones of the search team. The aforementioned shape, which I am now showing you in a red circle, is similar to the first stage of an R-7 missile. The second and third stages of the missile being fired in their trajectory are also clearly visible. I have marked the trajectory for you with a red arrow. Here I show you the same picture again, but in color. It is noticeable that there were several missiles. This time I turn my attention to the other various objects in the sky, making it clear that there are several missiles with their warheads that they have fired. But enough about this case. Let us now turn back to the case of Dyatlov and his group members and begin with a closer look at Semyon Zolotaryov's person. Trying to continue his military career, Semyon entered the Moscow Military Technical School in June 1945, which was reduced almost immediately. In April 1946, Zolotaryov then switched to the Leningrad Military Engineering School as part of a course, but was not allowed to continue serving in the army because this school was also cut. Then Semyon Zolotaryov moved to the Minsk Institute for Physical Education, which he successfully completed in 1951. He then returned to Pietogorsk in the North Caucasus and got a position as a physical education teacher at the Pietogorsk Pedagogical Institute. His next job was to work as a physical education teacher at the Pharmaceutical Institute in Pietogorsk, where he was fired after three and a half years. Since 1952, Semyon has been living in a marriage and in February 1956, they had a son. But six months later, in August, his wife left him and took the children with her. It is quite possible that Semyon Zolotaryov was not the most loyal soul, and therefore a divorce occurred with his wife. Another point about the divorce might have been that it might have had something to do with his job. Maybe his son's illness had something to do with it too. Another reason for the divorce could have been an argument with his aunt, because, according to Zolotaryov, she was demanding too much money from him for food and, according to her, there was physical harm. Zolotaryov, on the other hand, claimed that this was a mishap and that she stole the food he overpaid for from the sanatorium where she worked. It is quite possible that the aunt played the two married off against each other in revenge. Here you can see a picture of his son Sasha. Interestingly, his wife officially had a higher rank in the military than he himself. For she also fought in the Second World War until 1945 on the Soviet side, and held the rank of first lieutenant in the Air Force. Zolotaryov held the rank of sergeant major and received awards of an order and three medals from the Soviet army. I have been looking for the rank insignia specifically for you, and I will show you a picture of Zolotaryov with the various medals he received for his services during the war. This picture is very interesting in my opinion because something seems to be wrong with the women in the white coats. Perhaps this picture had something to do with Zolotaryov's studies. But you'll find out soon enough what exactly I'm trying to tell you. Here you can see an excerpt from the personal description of the website diatlovpass.com. It is mentioned here that Zolotaryov is said to have had tattoos, which was extremely unusual in Soviet times. However, I especially noticed the description of a tattoo. According to the autopsy report, this tattoo looked like an oddly shaped beat heart fire. Does this remind you of anything? This drawing doesn't really look like a real tattoo, doesn't it? It rather reminds of a sketch that was drawn in great haste on the skin with a felt pen. I think that the word Gena, 
which was also mentioned in the report, was not about a name of a close friend, but rather an indication that referred to the genes or the genetic material. Possibly it was about DNA damage caused by radiation exposure. I will now show you the sketch on Zolotaryov's forearm again, and give you a few references that will help you understand the whole thing better. Yes, you saw right. I immediately associated the sketch with a mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. You may now think that I am wrong in my assumption. But as the video progresses, I'll prove that I'm right about that. But before that, I might want to give you a few important details about the Soviet missile program. In the next pictures I show you the designers of the R-7 missile as well as its warhead. Among them Zyakovsky with his new technique for building the rocket fuselage, Kurchatov, the developer of the Russian atomic bomb, and Kolyorov, the developer of the first Russian ICBM. Now, as part of the fair use regulations, I show you a small excerpt from the documentation space travel under hammer and sickle in order to strengthen my position that the group did not die because of leaked rocket fuel. Einmal war war ich in der Steppe, als über uns eine Rakete auseinanderbrach. Es war übrigens die berühmte R7, mit der wir heute noch bemannte Raumschiffe in den Kosmos bringen. Und einer der Blöcke fiel, wie mir schien, direkt auf mich. Ich lief wie ein Hase durch die Steppe davon, bis ich stolperte und hinfiel. Doch glücklicherweise kam das Ding 100 Meter von mir entfernt runter. In diesem Sinne habe ich wirklich Angst verspürt. So much for the fuel leaking theory. But now let's look at some very interesting shots of the Dyatlov group. This picture was taken in Vije. At first glance, most of you won't see much in it, as most people will focus on the built-up area. If you take a closer look at the sky, you will undeniably notice an object in flight. Now if we zoom in, we can see the clear silhouette of an R-7 missile and as you will see later, this is not the only shot that reveals such an object. Here is another picture of the group in Vijay that doesn't show much at first glance. But if you really look at it you can see several other flying objects, but these are at a much greater distance. I have colored the pictures especially for you as this way you can see a lot more. So let's look at it all again in color. Next, you'll see some modern footage of Soyuz space rockets as reference images. Did you notice the similarity? However, these pictures were by no means all. Let's now take a look at Vijay from a different perspective. The most important buildings are labeled here so that you can better imagine where the Dyatlov group stayed during their passage. In the next montage I inserted the photo for you in a 3D view of Google Maps. In this montage I marked the direction Zolotaryov was going with a red arrow. After that, let's look at the full-size photo so you can see what exactly I want to show you. And here we are. It is like the other photos already shown. At first glance, there is nothing insanely exciting to see. But if you have a closer look and focus on the sky directly above the tree, which is slightly to the left of the center of the image, you should again notice a flying object that looks like the one shown earlier. I created a mask with an R7 missile to show you that the flying object has absolute congruence.
Of course, I have also determined the flight route for you and drawn it on a map. I think you'll notice pretty quickly that something is wrong in this area, because the vegetation seems to be reddish in color, and there is a larger bare area which is at the end of the assumed trajectory. On this picture you can see the village of Vigier from another position. Now please pay attention to the three trees in the foreground to the left of the middle. You should have noticed that their branches are missing on the left, which suggests that a lot of pressure was being put on the trees. After this discovery, of course, I also took a closer look at the previous station called Evedel, which the Dyatlov group passed by. In doing so, I first turned to the hotel, as the rescue team in addition to the Dyatlov group, also had to pass this place. To show you that my research was very extensive, I am now showing you both pictures taken by the rescue team and more modern pictures of the same building. Here you can still see the comparison of the pictures of the hotel from then to now. On closer inspection of the map section of Evedel it is also noticeable that something is wrong here, because here too there is red discoloration of the vegetation, as well as several large bare areas. Remember that there is a nature reserve nearby for later. Let us now turn to the rescue team. Here you can see two members, namely Georgi Atmanaki on the left and Vladislav Karelin on the right, both are located in front of the hotel in Evedel. The search for the Dyatlov group took place as follows. On February 20th, the UPI Sports Club met for a meeting when it became clear that something was wrong with the Dyatlov group, as they should have been back long ago. Therefore it was decided to put together search groups with the help of volunteers, which were transferred to Evedel by plane. Once there, the groups were supplemented by prison guards from the Evedel Gulag, led by Captain Alexei Chernyshov. From Evedel the journey went by two helicopters to the presumed search area. Here you can see a picture of the helicopter crew, which posed at Evedel Airport. In the center is helicopter commander Protuzenko and Colonel G. Ortukov, on the far right criminalist Lev Ivanov and next to him radio operator Egor Nevelin. Here we see a photo taken by Nikolai Kuznetsov. It shows four members of the 6th and last search team sent by the UPI in front of the used helicopter. Their names were, from left to right, Tulia Mohov, Vadim Fyodorov, Boris Suvorov, and Vladimir Askenazi. This is a picture of the arrival of the Askenadze group in the rescue camp, they also had a German shepherd dog to support the search. The dog that can be seen to the right of the group was the same as the one in the picture with Vladimir Ashkenazi. Vladimir Ashkenazi was the first to discover Ludmila Dubainina's body. In an interview he gave decades after the incident, he claimed that all of Sverdlovsk was talking about a missile that had exploded over the mountain at that time. According to his testimony, Colonel Ortyukov also claimed that it was a missile. However, Askenadze did not agree with this theory in the interview because he assumed murder. For the sake of completeness, we should take another look at the beginning of the search for the group. Boris Slepsov, a student at UPI, was the head of the first rescue team. It was decided to ask the local Monsi people if they could help with the search, whereupon Stepan Kurakov made himself available. The Slobsov group was taken to Mount Pumsel in 1055, a peak east of Otorten, by two helicopters. From there they made their way to Otorten, since this is where the last destination of the Dyatlov group is assumed. In Otorten, the rescue team found no traces of the Dyatlov group, and the aerial search did not reveal any new information for the time being. After about five hours of searching, the aerial reconnaissance found ski tracks on the Ospia River, after which the Slobsov group began the descent towards the Lazva River. When the rescue team finally found the Dyatlov group's tracks on the Ospia River, they followed them until they discovered the tent of the missing hikers on Mount Kolat Sayakl. When the tent was found, this photo was taken. I colored this picture for you too. First I show the map of Maysilenkov so that you can better imagine the conditions and the position. Then I show you the map of Chernobrov, the mentioned ufologist from earlier again. With the help of the red arrow you can see where the pressure wave hit the group from. Here you see a self-made montage I created, which shows the photo in relation to the 3D map from Google Maps. You can see that the photo was taken almost towards the east. As further proof, I created an animation for you with the sunrise and the light conditions during the day.
for reference I will show you a few more recent pictures that were taken from almost the same position. This is a photo showing Mikhail Fyodorovich Shestopalov. He was one of the investigators on site and had the rank of lieutenant colonel. It was believed that he was working in Unit 01662 which was building a railroad link near Evedel. The headquarter of the unit was located in Serov. He was an appointed human intelligence collector and his job was to investigate in many different military affairs, including leak of military secrets. This is a map section with the town of Serov. Pay closer attention to its surroundings. Do you notice anything? There are noticeably bald spots, the shape of which you should definitely remember for later. Now let's take a look at a photo of Lt. Col. Shestopalov during his investigation at Dyatlov Pass. Do you notice anything unusual? Let me show you. The objects flying over the hilltop are an R-7 missile, the warhead of which has been separated from the main stage and is on its final approach. In the first red circle you can see the first stage, followed by the second red circle, which marks the position of the warhead. Then I took the liberty of marking the flight of the warhead with a red arrow to show you the direction of flight. Let's have a look at the same montage in color. Of course, it wasn't all I found out about the picture. Did you notice anything else besides the missile? Please pay attention to the upper left corner of the photo. It is noticeable that there is a strong incidence of light from there. This is very unusual as the sun cannot be there. Maybe you are now asking why. But this is very easy to answer, as this position would be far too north for the sun. So it has to be another light source, like a nuclear explosion. I'm going to show you a montage to clarify my point of view. Have you noticed that the sun goes behind our backs? This should actually make sense, as the sun should be close to the southern turn radius at this time of year. You will now see a map view from above. I have drawn both the viewing angle and the trajectory of the warhead and you can clearly see the place of the detonation. Perhaps there are still some among the viewers who question my argumentation. So let's move on to more pictures of the search team.
perhaps you notice the strange incidence of light as well as the flying objects in the pictures. Sometimes the light came from the north in the pictures, which is extremely noticeable in terms of intensity, and does not correspond to the normal course of the sun. On the other hand, I noticed that the search team took cover behind large rocks and very often looked towards the ground or away from the bright light in order to obviously protect their eyes. This procedure can partly be observed in the pictures of the Dyatlov group.